When it comes to motivation in the music studio, rewards and awards are pretty common. In fact, incredibly common. Most music teachers that I talk to have something like this. Either they use stickers or they have like a pri prize box, a um, special music money store with little trinkets people can buy, or candy that they give out, chocolate, other stuff like that. And I am not here to tell you, don't do this, do this instead. That's the correct way, that's the right way, that's the wrong way, right? That's never what I'm here to do. But what I would like to bring to you today is five different ideas from the book Punished by Rewards by Alfie Kahn. Let me know if you have read this book, but if you haven't, it is a pretty substantial book. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. I actually listened to it on audiobook, so I don't have a book to show you, I just have my phone. That is the audiobook which I listened to several years ago now. And it's, don't get me wrong, it's well written, it's engaging, but it's big. And so what I wanted to do was bring you five of the ideas from it that can help us to start thinking about these ideas. And maybe then you go get the book. Maybe you branch off from these ideas further. You could take many different approaches. And I'm not here to give you an answer to each one of these questions. What I wanted to do today is to open our minds to these ideas. Some of them are going to feel pretty uncomfortable, and they did for me too when I listened to the book, but I think we learn a lot when we step outside of our comfort zone. And then we can always disagree later, but we have to listen fully first. So that's what these ideas are about, and I'm gonna share them with you right now. So here's the first one. Carrots can be sticks. This is lesson number one from Punished by Rewards for Alfie Khan. Now he doesn't use these words, but this is one of the ideas. What I'm talking about here is the fact that we assume that positive reinforcement rewards are good and negative reinforcement punishments are bad. That's kind of a common, generally perceived to be true knowledge these days in most places. And yet, the point Alfie makes in the book here is that although we see the punishment as punishment, it's in the title, punished by rewards. Rewards can be punishment too. When we incentivize people with a carrot, when we give them a reward for what they do, we train them to only do the thing for that reward. So in a way, the carrot becomes a punishment. The other way this is true is even more interesting to me. So let's imagine I tell you that if you, let me see, if you wait until dinner time and you don't have anything until then, I will give you a piece of white chocolate. Do you like white chocolate? I don't know. I'm gonna give you this Lindor, okay? So, if you wait all the way till dinner time, from now, whenever that is for you, even if it's 8 a.m. right now, <laughs> I'm gonna give this to you. You're gonna have it as your treat. Or choose your treat of preference, right? Something you really, really like. And let's say you wait until six. And you think that's dinner time, but in my house, no, sorry, it's seven. It's always been seven. It is 100% a rule in my parents' house that dinner is at, a, at seven. We could go over there today, it would be on the table at seven. So, you're wrong. You haven't waited until dinner, you can't have it. And you're now starving because you were expecting to have this thing at six. So you have, let's say, a carrot stick and you get to 7 p.m. and I still won't give this to you. Doesn't it feel like I've taken that away from you? Like you were entitled to it and I've taken it away? And it especially feels that way for a kid. It doesn't feel like I offered you something and then you didn't achieve it so you don't get the thing. It feels like 
you um, basically had this. You feel like you already had this item. And I took it away from you. And that's one of the traps of rewards. The book is called Punished by Rewards by Alfie Khan. <laughs> that's bad parenting, my friend. Yeah, I'm giving you a silly example. But you see what I mean about that being feeling like something was taken away rather than something you didn't get. Felt like something you were supposed to get and now you didn't. And so it feels the same as if I gave you the chocolate and then took it away in some ways. And they did so well for 90% of the time. Exactly, Laurie. So that's part of what the idea is of carrots being sticks. Now I said, like I said, this is a long book. He goes into much more detail, but that's one little nugget I wanted you to chew on. The next one is, when in doubt, adultize. So I gave you that example before, which was kind of a kid version. But where I think Alfie does really well in this book is he often takes something in a kid realm and puts it into the adult realm and it immediately becomes clear what the problem is with that situation. So let's say that chocolate thing happened. Doesn't seem like a big deal to us, but we know kids care quite a lot about chocolate. <laughs> in general, and so they're going to see that quite differently to the way we would, right? So let's move that into our adult world. Let's say that you work for me in Insurance Incorporated, Inc. And in Insurance Incorporated, Inc., every year you've worked for me, for three years so far, every year you've gotten a bonus. I've given you a bonus at Christmas, okay? So two weeks before Christmas, I say, come on in. Great news, got a bonus for you. You did great work this year. Here's 500 quid, okay? And you go out and you're used to spending that on a fancy restaurant that you would never go to otherwise. It's like your fun annual tradition. Year four, I don't give it to you. And you come to me and you say, I still did great work. I'm sorry, did I do something wrong? I, can you tell me what I did? And I say, yeah, you did fine. But, you know, you seem to be intrinsically motivated now. And so I thought you were okay to keep going by yourself at this stage. Are you going to want to do your best work in year five? Nope. You do not feel valued. And... That bonus didn't really matter. Okay, 500 euro, 500 dollars, that's great, that's nice, right? But I could have just paid you that amount more per year and made it part of the salary. I didn't do it that way. I did it as a bonus. And that means it should be an extra, but it doesn't feel like an extra. After the first few times, it feels like something you're entitled to. And it feels like it's why you did the work. Now, if I didn't give you that bonus the first few years, you probably would have worked just as hard and you would have continued working that way because you want to do a good job for this uh, mindlessly boring insurance company. All right, no offense to anyone working in insurance. I'm sure it's not all boring. Do you see how taking that and putting it in the structure of money and adultness gives it a different flavor? Now that's not directly related to the chocolate analogy we did before, but you see how we transform something that could have been a kid situation into an adult situation. Let's move it back into the kid realm so you can see what I mean. In the kid realm, that's the equivalent of month one, I'm gonna go months instead of years because years are so long for kids. So month one of lessons. The kid gets to the end of the month, they've practiced five days a week, every week, and they've been making good progress and working really hard. And so you give them a bonus. Maybe it's the red one this time. Month two, same deal. They keep practicing, keep going forward, give them another bonus. Month three, same. Month four, they get to the end of the month, ready for their chocolate, and you say, 
Oh no, I think you're going great now. You've passed that beginner stage. You can keep going. You're doing great work. Do you want to keep doing the thing? Do they want to keep doing the thing? I don't think so. But they might have been intrinsically motivated in the first place. So sometimes we can rob kids of that intrinsic motivation or that just interest and desire to learn by giving them unnecessary rewards. Like I said, not all these ideas are going to be comfortable for you. And I'm not saying you have to 100% agree with me or go all the way through with these ideas. But I want to give us five nuggets to help us think. So let's go to number three. Praise can be candy. This one hurt me the most. So if you've been in pain so far because you're giving out candy, know that I'm with you on this one. I don't give out candy. I never have in my studio. But I will heap on praise. And when praise is done the wrong way, Alfie would argue, and I've come to mostly agree with you, with him, that uh, praise can act that way. Praise can be a reward as much as anything else in the wrong framing and the wrong context is the nuance that I've added to that. Alfie would go further than this, so again, listen to the book if you're curious on his opinions. But the reason praise can be candy is because students can come to rely on it just as much as that chocolate at the end of the month. It can be what they're actually working towards. They're working so that they come to the lesson and you say, good job, or you're amazing, or... Right? They're working for that appreciation. And when we're not careful, they can end up working only for that appreciation. So the praise can act just the same way that the candy did. Now it's not exactly the same. And this is why I wrestled with this so much, because we do need to praise kids, right? We need to show them that we see what they're doing, that we see the work they're putting in. But what I've come to land upon with this particular one is that I needed to adjust the way I praised kids. This is actually one of the reasons I didn't share anything about this book really for several years. I had to digest it and learn new ways of praising. And I've come to be better at praising through pointing out things that they did so that they acknowledge themselves that they did the thing. Like it's entirely fact-based. And a good example of this is just simply, you did it. You did it has a very different flavor to it than well done. You did it. It's just a fact and it feels a bit cold somehow, but it doesn't feel that way when you do it. It has all this emotion behind it sometimes. So let's say a student worked really hard on a piece for three weeks and three, third week they're saying, I'm just not getting this. Miss Teacher, this is not going to work, right? I'm not getting anywhere. I can't do it. I'm feeling really down about it. You have a chat with them and you give them some strategies and you send them home. And they come back the next week and they can play it, whatever the technical challenge was. Maybe it's not perfect, but they can do it. They've made huge progress. And you turn to them and you say, You did it. That is so much more like you've seen what they actually did than so much of the praise that we give out. It has to be genuine, it has to be real like any other praise, but that can be powerful. Now you can take this much further in terms of pointing out facts. You can say, I saw that at the start you included the forte and then you stuck with the same tempo the whole way through. You weren't able to do that last week and this week you can and I know it's because you put all this practice in. Right? So I'm not saying don't praise. Absolutely not. And neither is Alfie, by the way. <laughs> in one part of it that I re-listened to in preparation for this, he says that he's not saying not to smile at people. Because obviously people have said that his research, <laughs> taken that from his research before. He's not saying don't smile at people, don't be friendly, don't be nice, don't be supportive. But 
what I think he is saying and I think he's right about is the way we praise can be harmful and can become a crutch. So that's number three. Two more to go. Play can become work. This is one that takes care as well. If we're not really careful about the way we talk, the way we frame things, the incentives we give out, we can transform an activity that students thought of as fun and engaging into work or school or whatever way they see it. And it doesn't have to be transformed that way. Kids are made to learn. And they have this innate desire. You've seen kids working and working at something. But sometimes when adults intervene, when adults try to reinforce that behavior that didn't need reinforcing, that was fine, we can make that play into work. We can make it into an obligation. Let's have another analogy. Let's go to you and a housemate. So you're living with someone, you can imagine it's your partner, you can imagine it's just a, a house share, okay? You're living with this person and you see that they're working so hard and their job is really tough on them, they're a nurse, they're working really long hours and you start thinking, oh, it would be lovely if I made dinner for them, just to show my appreciation, show I see the work that they're putting in. So you sit down and you come up with a great recipe that they're going to love and you put it together with such care and you sit down together and have it for when they get in from their shift. And you loved putting that together. I know it's hard for you to imagine if you are someone who hates cooking, but just imagine it. Sometimes cooking can be really fun. It's really enjoyable to do. But let's say they can then, they come back to you the next morning and they say, oh, I'm heading off to work now. I so appreciated you cooking last night. It made such a difference to me because I was able to eat a healthy meal and I feel so much better today and it is worth so much to me. So would you consider doing this for me every day this week if I pay you 10 euro per meal, $10? $20, doesn't matter what the amount is. They offered to pay you to keep making that for them. And the truth is you knew that this whole week they are working extra long shifts because they're covering for a friend who's uh, dealing with their sick mom and it's all this situation, right? So you were already planning on doing this all week. You just hadn't said anything to them. But do you feel good about doing it now? It was essentially play. It was something you were doing because it was a choice. It was from interest and love and care. And now they've taken that and they've put, in, put a dollar amount on it. And if you're a kid, a dollar amount might not be the way this comes out, but it might be in, oh, if you keep doing that, I will give you this. Now, that's where we need to be careful of play becoming work. It's that word keep. It's something they're already doing and we're trying to motivate them to continue it. And sometimes we just trot on our own feet. Okay, last one to think about. Remember, these are not set in stone. These are starts of conversations, and I hope you'll continue them in your head or out loud. Student-centered comments. What I mean here is getting students to acknowledge their own work and putting them at the center of what we're talking about. So instead of praise, or instead of motivation, um, motivating tactics of other kinds, rewards, stickers, anything like that, it's about saying things with the student at the center of it. We talk about student-centered learning, right, all the time. And student-centered comments are where we're the easy uh, description of this would be with pride, okay? So instead of saying, I'm so proud of you, I say, you must be so proud of yourself. They are at the center of that comment. And you can do this with tons of other comments, right? And this is more something that branched off, I think, after 
reading Alfie's book and seeing how this would work for us in our relationships with students. But it's something that's become really valuable for me to think about and I don't always get it right, right? But I might sometimes come out with the wrong thing and then say the right thing after it. So know that you can do that if that's where you're at, if that's what happens to you, because it certainly has happened to me. Try putting the student at the center of the praise or the comment and see where that takes you. So those were our five different ideas. Let's just review them real quick. Carrots can be stick, right? The positive reinforcement can be just as negative as negative reinforcement. When in doubt, adultize. When you're not sure how this feels or how it's going to affect student motivation, put it in the adult world. Put it in the realm of a career and money because it's normally easy to translate it to that and you will see it in a whole new light. Praise can be candy. Praise can be just as much of a reward as physical objects can and should be treated with care as well in the way that we do it and in when we do it. When we do praise, can we try and make our comments student-centered so that the student is at the middle of it? And play can become work if we're not careful. I'm not. I wanted to include that because I talk so much about play all over the place and I think it is so important. But if we make it incentivized, sometimes we transform it into something that is actually work. Mm -hmm.